Amen. I uh, just stopped for a minute, and I just praying. I said, Lord, would you reel me in? I uh, My mind's going this way and that, and it's so good to see everyone. And, of course, Linda's here this morning, so we'll have to pray for crowd control. But <laughs> isn't it good to see everyone? Um, we are planning to have communion uh, next Sunday. Can you believe uh, June is about gone? And uh, anyway, and we're going to have it. Uh, we're going to have uh, little, we got little wafers. They're not, I, well, they're the little breads uh, in the, all wrapped up. Well, they're not wrapped individually. I'll get it out in a minute. Anyway, as little touching as possible. Uh, we're going to have the, the trays out on a separate table across from the information table. So you'll have a cup, a throwaway cup with the, the bread, the little bread, very easy to chew, to swallow. And then the uh, uh, partially filled cup on top of that. So when you come in, you'll take your, your, your bread and the cup uh, together and you'll bring them to the seat and put them in the holder um, on the back of the pew. And then at the right time, we will have that. So that'll be not passing that around and and all that, like I say, touching as um, as few times as possible, and I, and I think that's a pretty decent plan. We did explore the uh, the cups with the that were individually wrapped, and I looked at a video. Uh, I follow the church we attended in Terre Haute on the YouTube their YouTube channel, and I saw uh, Pastor the Pastor Alfie there, kind of trying to navigate, maneuver, taking the the top off of that thing, and he did one of these, oops. Uh -huh. So <laughs> I told Carrie, I said, ooh, I said, we better rethink this, so we changed, we changed that plan. And, and of course, he's, um, he's, he's, a very, he's really a good guy, and he's got a sense of humor. So when he's telling them to be careful to not spill it, but it's like, but if you do spill it, you know, spill it on yourself, not on the pew, you know, so. Anyway, a little bit of inside humor there. Um, we, you can tell our format has changed, and, and there's, of course, not, you know, there's various reasons, but uh, one of the main reasons is just to have the, the, the service so we can get in, not hurrying anything, but also not taking more time than is necessary, and so I can get everything on the DVD. We still have several people who are following us on the DVD, and uh, that's, that's really good. And so one of the changes then you can see in the first is, um, uh, and in the, we'll be working this out as we go, but welcome announcements and prayer. So we'll have prayer requests at, at this time now as I'm having announcements. But I think I've been here long enough that I'm not gonna hurt your feelings too much or offend you too much if I urge us to, let's be brief there. So we can, so we can again, Move it along without hurrying, and yet we hear your prayer requests. And then as we go down, you'll see the order of service, quiet before the Lord. Wanda's going to pray for us. We can sit quietly, and we can pray for those things ourselves also. I think I'm also going to come up with something to leave a place on the bulletin or maybe an insert where we can write. If you have a prayer request that day, you can write that down and then give that to me or one of the guys on the board and then uh, we'll carry that on. Well, I will carry it to our Wednesday prayer group, but then we'll probably send that around also. So, you know, this world is in such turmoil, but we have a God greater than all, a God infinite in wisdom. So it shouldn't surprise us that he gives us a good plan to go forward if we get on our knees and bow before him and say, Lord, guide us through this shouldn't really, you know, owe me of little faith. It does. It's like, well, you know what? That's a pretty good plan. Well, God did that. And as, as we move forward in these things, as we change and transform, uh, not only our lives individually, but as a group, and saying, hey, you know what? What looks so bad, wow, look what God is doing in this. Our God, how blessed be his holy name. Amen. So do we have a prayer request that you'd like for us to have to our attention uh, this morning? Yes. James Braxton, I work with his wife, and uh, he's seeing a doctor tomorrow for a head image. Can you bring that to our attention? 
Okay, Fat Hip, James Grafton. Okay. Okay, anyone else? Yes. Steve, their son in law, gallbladder surgery. Thank you. And see, I think what we'll do, and if, yeah, of course, if anybody's writing these down, we will carry these on to a prayer meeting. Um, anything else? Oh, yes. We, you know what, I'm glad you said that, but you didn't have to say it because we certainly are praying for that dear, sweet woman of God. Yes. Karen Gray, Jim Gray's wife, had a stroke on the 10th of January. We will lift that her and that family before the Lord in prayer. Yes. Okay, and we're going to pray, but just a couple more announcements. Not, we're having communion next week. We will have um, resume evening service next week, July 6th, men's study, board meeting coming up on July 13th. Anything else I need to bring our attention to before we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We, we thank you for stirring in our hearts to come out to worship you, to bow before you. Now, Lord, we want to come to this service prepared to do those things and to have walked with you through the week that you would be drawing us closer and closer. But, but there's always, Lord, the, the loose ends and the, the cleanup that needs to be done. So we'd like to just stop and allow you Holy Spirit of God to to capture us to draw us to yourself to bring to mind anything that we need to confess to you as sin slow down our hearts and our minds Lord that we can truly be filled with thoughts of you your word of truth and worship you together Lord we bring these several requests before you with for Steve and uh, the gallbladder surgery for Jim or James with the, uh, the, the serious uh, hip problem for um, Jim Gray's wife, Jane, I believe, if I got that right, you know the name, Lord, uh, for Jeanette, our dear sweet sister in the Lord. Um, I know I'm forgetting something, Lord, but you, you do know these things. We bring these before you. We bring ourselves before you. We bring Faith Fellowship Church of Tennessee, Illinois, before you. How we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would turn to either 336 in the hymnal, or if you don't want to handle the hymnal, we have that printed on your bulletin. There is a fountain, and I believe I have a note there that we are going to read together verse 3. Sing 1 and 2, read together verse 3. Sing 4 and 5. Powerful, powerful hymn. Stand, I see, but yeah. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains. All their guilty stains and sinners plunged beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. There may I go. While as he wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, and there may I go while as he wash all my sins away. Reading together verse 3, Dear dying Lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God 
be saved to sin no more, be saved to sin no more, be saved to sin no more, till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Verse 4. Ever since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die and shall be till I die and shall be till I die it has been my theme and shall be till I die when this poor lisping stammering tongue lies silent in the grave then in a nobler sweeter song i'll sing thy power to save i'll sing thy power to save i'll sing thy power to save then in a nobler sweeter song i'll sing thy power to what good singing you may be seated and turn to nothing but the blood what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. <clears throat> What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my pardon this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my cleansing this my plea Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus nothing can for sin atone
Let's pray again. <clears throat> Thank you, mighty one, for the great sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Our focus, our attention today on that washing and on that cleansing. Holy Spirit of God, draw us to your holy word. Press it deep into our hearts and minds. How we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. How do we believe? How do we believe and live by the promises of God no matter what? No matter the hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, and tsunamis of life, both literally and figuratively, 
No matter if the lid blows off, society through racial tensions or the bottom drops out of the economy. Who are the people who believe God no matter what? Who fully trust him with their lives? The ones who can say with the psalmist in Psalm 46, God is a safe place to hide ready to help when we need him. We stand fearless at the cliff edge of doom, courageous in sea storm and earthquake. Before the rush and roar of oceans, the tremors that shift mountains, Jacob wrestling God fights for us. God of angel armies protects us. Who are these people, and how did they do it? The Apostle Peter answers both of those questions in our text this morning. He begins his second letter, what we are beginning to study this week. He begins his second letter, 2 Peter, possibly within two years or so after his first letter, reassuring the sojourners the scattered exiles that God had given them everything that they needed for godly lives and to escape the corruption of this world, to withstand the trials of life no matter the circumstances. But how do they believe that? How do those words of assurance and provision, how did that happen? How did that become the reality of their lives? Well, Peter told them that also, and he tells us the key is knowing God, truly knowing God. So who are the people who are ready for life and godliness? Those who know God. And how do they do it? By truly knowing God. Not trying to be cute there. I think you'll see as this develops. Who are these people? The ones that know God. How do they live like that? By knowing God. There are two groups of people on the planet. The saved and the unsaved. Those who know God, the saved, and those who only know about God, the unsaved. And these two groups can each be divided into two categories or two other groups. First, those who only know about God can be divided this way. The non-religious who know something about God. The non-religious who know something about God. Romans 1.18 describes them. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Everyone on this planet, in spite of their protests or denials, everyone on this planet knows something about God. It's buried too deep in their hearts, in their inner psyche, to, for, for them to, to plead otherwise. They know something about God. So we have the non-religious who know something about God. And then we have the deeply religious who know a lot about God. And we'll see later as we develop our message this morning that we'll look at the zealous Jews in our study as an example of this. So we have two groups, the saved and the unsaved, the unsaved who know something about God and the saved who know God. Those who know God can be divided in this way. First, those who know God, but they're not sure they know him. It's a question of assurance. They are vague and unsure in their relationship with him. They lack assurance. These are the people that Peter says in our text this morning, very sadly, they have become ineffective and unfruitful in their knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the second group in this group, those who know that they know God, those who know that they know God. These people have great trust in God in every part of their lives. They are growing in their faith. They are making the most of the gift of salvation. So what is Peter's big lesson then and now? Make certain that through our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that we know him. 
make sure that our knowledge of him is not ineffective and unfruitful. How do we do that? Well, first, we need to know where we stand before a holy God. And now we're at point one on your study sheet, our standing. Peter is writing to believers. Obviously, when we're speaking to the church at large, there are going to be non-believers in audience also. But his primary audience is to believers. It's to these people, to the dispersia. We said they were, because of persecution and hostilities, they were scattered all over the world. They had to run for their lives. They've had to leave their countries, take up, pull up roots, start in new places. Well, they need good information. They don't need fluff. They need information, kind of like we need now with our society, it seemingly just an explosion waiting to happen. They're standing. He wanted to point out first they're standing. We stand in righteousness. When I would say we, I'm speaking of believers. We stand in righteousness before God because we have obtained a faith on par with the faith of the apostles. Second Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of God and save, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a grace decision. This obtaining isn't something that we've gone out and grasped for ourselves, but something that God has brought to us. A brief word study there, it says this word obtain in the Greek, it means to obtain by lot, to obtain by or as if by the random casting of lots, often understood as indicative of the divine will. And that's the meaning here. This was the divine will, and we saw that in First Peter where he spoke of these things much more clearly. In fact, I have the text here. The next is we follow along a grace decision. Uh, Peter is writing to the same group of people in the first letter. First Peter 1, 1 to 5. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. They have obtained this faith because they're, of, they're elect exiles. And this was according down in verse 2 here to the foreknowledge of God the Father. We won't read all of those verses, although they are very relevant. Uh, we just won't take the time to do that. Uh, next here, Peter is writing to people to whom God has given the ability to believe that they are accepted by God. Now, here's key. They, they has given them the ability to believe that they are accepted by God only by the righteousness of Christ. And see, that's the true gift of salvation. Anyone who, 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 who's trying to figure out where they are before God and they don't understand that there's only one way to be right before God is through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now we're going to look at a couple of texts, but I want us to understand that knowing that we have nothing to offer, nothing to bring to the table, is a place of tremendous blessing. So, the people to whom Peter is writing know that they must be found in Christ. So our standing these people, we know that we must be found in Christ when you're standing before God. How does that happen? Well, and his righteousness, Philippians 3, 9, Paul writes, and be found in him, speaking of Christ, not having what? A righteousness of my own. See, that again, the blessing. I know my standing before God. I, I'm so glad I don't have to stand before God in my righteousness. Amen. See, if you know anything at all, you know that's a bad place to be. But see, so many, well, the majority of this world's blind to that. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Let me just say something else here. And I was going to do this earlier. Well, I was going to do it at some point, maybe earlier. But we are going to, we're looking at the first nine verses, and we're going to kind of do our jogging routine through that. We're going to come back and look at the same text next week, because this is kind of part one, because there's way too much. But I wanted us to get to, to one of the capstones, and that being verse 9 uh, this week. And it will probably go at least through verse 11 next week, maybe a little further. We'll see how that goes. But the righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, on believing. 
Many very religious people have a zeal or an enthusiasm for God, but do not know God personally. What did we say? Two groups of people, saved and unsaved. Those who know something about God. Those who know a lot about God, but they still don't know God. That's this group. The Jews in Romans 10, that's this group, were zealous for God, but did not know God. See, when you know something about him, well, they didn't know him in his utter holiness and majesty and might. When you know something about God, you know something about, you know something about holiness. And you so, know something about majesty. And you know something about might and the power of God. But you've never fallen before it. What did we look at a, two or three weeks ago? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. They've never been to that place. Did not realize, so they did not realize the futility of trying to establish their own righteousness. See, you know people who are going on their own goodness and on their own merit, you know they've never been, been bowed before the throne of a holy God because, you know, either you're bowed before the throne of a holy God, you thought, oh, that's gone. There's one thing that you can claim, and that's belief in Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the cleansing. And we're going to see later that's the one thing that these people had forgotten. Romans 10, 2, for I bear them witness that they haven't zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Knowledge, by the way, as the knowledge the, that is the knowing, the experiential, that this is where I'm living this knowledge and I'm coming to know it. And you've got some interesting notes at the very end of your study sheets on the differences. The, the word gnosis and the word epinosis. And they're both good, it's both good knowledge. The one knowledge you'll, you can read is, is knowledge, it's, it's about God. And it's good to have knowledge about God. In fact, we're going to see that that knowledge is part of growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. But that knowledge about God takes you so far, you have to live that out, you have to obey that, you have to follow through, you have to be directed by that to lead to then the epinosis, which is the knowledge, this is knowing God. This is, this is the person this is the person who truly believes God and never loses sight of the precious promises. I bear them witness they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. That's the experiential knowledge for being ignorant of the righteousness of God. And this is what happens. And seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. The second main point this morning, we need to understand our standing. We need to know where we stand before holy God. Now we need to understand um, our opportunity. Our righteous standing before God means we qualify to receive the blessing of multiplied grace and peace. Second Peter 1, 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Colossians 1, 1, 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. See, this is God, quali we are at a very privileged place. We have no right to be there. That's, it's undeserved favor. We have no, it's a very privileged place. It's all because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ at Calvary. It's everything comes back to the finished work of Christ. The dynamic of grace and peace being multiplied is not based on God's ability or willingness to supply, but on our, our ability to receive, to believe, and to receive. The, the, the supply is there. It's our ability to believe that and to receive that. The more we truly know him through living by the words, that is, personal experience and fellowship, the more we're able to receive and believe more data, receive more information about God, knowledge about God. And then here's the, uh, the notes. You have these. I have them actually in this part of my, in my notes, but you have them at the end. And you can look at that. You can even glance at that. Now it might help you, but you can read that later. Very helpful by Dick Lucas and Christopher Green on uh, the, the two words that I just gave us a brief accounting of. Next here, when this happens, our understanding of the nature and character of God expands exponentially. Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. See, the God of hope fills us. What is, what is the great blessing is believing. You're filled with all joy and peace in believing. 
And now, and we have to remember, it's always the, the, the Holy Spirit of God doing this work in our lives. We're going to look at it a little bit later, working our, out our salvation, but it's going to be the Holy Spirit of God doing that, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. See, and when God tells it, when he's making, causing the abundance, it's truly abundant. It's, it's beyond us, beyond the magnitude of our minds. Multiply joy and peace. God fills us with joy and peace when we believe the truth about God. When, it, these are the wow moments. When, wow, that is just, when you just, it's like you just, you, you read this and it's just, it's just amazing. Multiplied hope, the Holy Spirit then causes us to, and here's the word, it's uh, perisuo, perisuo, and it's to superabound, to superabound in hope. Now, is that kind of hope possible in times like ours? Uh, people destroying everything, it seems. Um, maybe I've not... I can't recall a, a, a hatred between political parties in all the days of my life. Uh, the economy, we don't know what's. Is it possible to have this superabounding hope now? Yes. If we believe God. Do you see? Because this world can't touch it. The lid can blow off and the bottom can fall out. <laughs> this, this hope isn't dependent on any of those things. This hope is dependent on who? On God. Now, now, you know, when you know him, see, when you really know him, when you just don't have some truth in your mind about him or about some promise of God rattling around in your mind, but when you know him, you know, you don't need to be shaken. You know, we know that because we know him. Thirdly, divine power. Because of our righteous standing, God is free to give us his power for all things concerning life and godliness. We have to understand this. If we didn't have the standing before him in the righteousness of Christ, because God's a God of justice, he's a holy God, he couldn't do any of these things. The only thing he would be left to do because he's a God of holiness and justice is to condemn us to hell, is to cast us away from himself. But because we've believed in Christ and received this gift, a righteousness not our own, now God says... <clears throat> Open up the floodgates, boys. Heaven came down in glory, filled my soul. See, this is how God operates. This is to the person who, the multiplied grace and peace, the multiplied joy and peace that Paul wrote of in Romans 15, that a Holy Spirit can use that to cause us to superabound in hope. This is from Starting, it's starting, the light bulb is shining brightly. We're understanding who God is and how he operates. We're going to get to something real. I can't wait to get to the end. Don't you say amen. Yeah, don't you say amen. Second Peter 1, 3. Because of our righteous standing, God is free to give us. I read that, didn't I? All, all things concerning life and godliness. Second Peter 1, 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Now see, there's our word, epinosis. That's the experiencing, that we experience that, we're living that, we're obeying that, we're submitting to that. It's not the knowledge about God. Those that only have the knowledge about God don't have this. And there are believers who, their knowledge, this, that this knowledge that they had, it's spoiled, it's, he's gonna call it later, it's become ineffective and unfruitful. And they have no assurance. They haven't lost their salvation. We don't lose your salvation if you're truly saved. They just don't know. They don't know God like they used to, like they need to know him. Now we know these things. God gives us the power for godly living through actually knowing him, understanding the nature and character of God. Well, just think about that. We talk about understanding the nature and character of God. Doesn't it follow then that as the Holy Spirit is working in our lives, we're understanding more and more the nature and character of God? Guess, guess what? We're going to be changing into more and more, transformed by the renewing of our minds. The nature and character of God. You see that? How it, not our man-made rules and, and, and these outward observances, but we're going to be becoming more like God. All things for life and godliness, Peter wrote. So filled with truth concerning the nature and character of God and abounding in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, the power and nature of God becomes a reality of, in our lives. 
God, this is what God does. Great promises. Because of our righteous standing, God is free to make promises that will enable us to share in his divine nature. See, this is the same thing. He's free to do this. He's free to promise us all of these things. If we were standing before him in our own righteousness, if we were refusing to receive the gift of salvation, he wouldn't be free to do that. The only thing he's free to do because of his character and nature is to condemn us in our sin. But through Christ, do we understand it? How the, the amazing gift that through Christ, now he's free. God makes some pretty wild promises. And he's free to do that because he's looking on us as the righteousness of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Second Peter 1, 4, by which he has granted to us his precious, very valuable, and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. The more we know God in this way, the more our understanding expands. In this way, as in experiencing God, trusting him moment by moment, obeying him in our daily routine, knowing him in this way, the more we're able to believe his promises to us. See, I could say, you know what, I'm gonna, Joyce, I'm gonna write you a check for a million dollars tomorrow. Um, yeah, you probably wouldn't be very excited about that, would you? In fact, you're probably pretty worried about me because you know, <laughs> I don't know if I'd write, be able to write you a check for $50. You wouldn't want to hurt my, but, but when you, if, if God, if, his promises, when we know who he is, it's like, well, that God can do these things that he's promising. And now we believe him even more, don't we? And now we trust him even more. And now we're even more ready to obey him and to submit to him, but bow, to bow ourselves, to submit ourselves under the mighty hand of God. For this very reason, oh, well, <clears throat> when we live according, again, to the nature of God becomes the, our reality in living. Next, divine motivation. Peter urges those who stand in righteousness before God to make every effort to build on what God has provided. Verses 5 through 7. <clears throat> We're not going to look at the meanings of all these right now. Again, I want to get to verse 9. So this is, this, is a, this is a part of the study that's not going to get as much attention as what we could truly give it. But for 2 Peter 1, 5. For this very reason, make every effort to su supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control. Now, knowledge here, guess which word that is? It's the knowledge about God. See, the knowledge about God is a good thing. It's not good knowledge and bad knowledge. Good knowledge about, you know, knowledge about God and, and uh, bad knowledge is, no. Anyway, they're both good. <clears throat> I'm getting myself confused. But the, the knowledge about God is good, and then the knowledge where we truly know God is good. They work together. It's when they aren't working together is when the believer has the problem. Okay. And virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. We are urged to make the most of God's investment in our lives. This is what Paul referred to as working out our salvation not working for our salvation. You've heard me say that before. That's not what this is. People misunderstand that. They misunderstand that because they misunderstand the gospel. <clears throat> and you know why they misunderstand the gospel? Because they don't understand God and they don't understand sin. Until you understand God and his holiness and sin and its depth of depravity, you don't understand the gospel. And you might be foolish enough to believe that you can work for your salvation you might be foolish enough to believe that you can come before that holy throne and have something to offer. The light bulb hasn't come on yet. So, but this is what Paul referred to in Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, <clears throat> but more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So you see that. You see that our responsibility... We've been get, God's made this great investment in us. Now, we live these things out. But when you see then the next verse, that's really, that's God working in us too. There's other verses that are really good there. We're not going to cover those. We're going to get right now to the conclusion. It's number six, actually, 
kind of changed on your study sheets. But in the last two verses, two very different portraits. One portrait is of the believer who lives with the blessing of sight. And the other, the believer who lives in fear and insecurity caused from the loss of sight. Second Peter 1, 8, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. See, the, the picture of that is, is two, two things. <clears throat> is this keeping, this, this growing in the grace and knowledge, this, the things in verses uh, 5 through 7 that we looked at, that um, supplement your faith with moral excellence, moral excellence with knowledge, etc. Those things keep us. We're, we're in the flow. We're connected to the vine. And if we're not doing that, then you become nearsighted. You know what you all are right now? You're blurs. <laughs> I can still kind of see you, but I can't see clearly. And that's what the text is, is speaking of, that, that people still know these truths, <clears throat> but they don't see them clearly enough. They've lost sight of their true significance. The sighted person, this person has taken to heart Peter's instruction, such as in 2 Peter 1, 5 to 7, adding to faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge, etc., and has responded with obedience to God's promises. The nearsighted person, this person, this person, well, this person hasn't listened. This person hasn't obeyed. They, they've not grown in their faith, and not growing means no longer truly knowing because they lost the ability to believe what is beyond them. They've kind of reverted. Again, they haven't lost their salvation. They just can't believe these amazing, precious, valuable, great promises and they have no assurance they can't get past just what's right in front of their face because see I can still I can still see right there and that's about as far and I'm in I'd be in bad shape without my glasses and 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 that's why they're they're fearful and so insecure in this world and and it's like they can they can be without hope and 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 it's it's the person that do you know the Lord Oh, I sure hope so. Now, see, a lot of people, they sure say, I sure hope so. They don't know him at all. But there are believers who know the Lord. They are saved. But the sadness is they don't know. What little is left of their knowledge, and this is very sad, what little is left of their knowledge of Jesus Christ has become ineffective and unfruitful. See, it may, it said, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing, they've lost that. The believing part, they don't, they don't believe it. Any, they've lost, it's become what they, what they did know, it's become ineffective and unfruitful. V verse 9 again in chapter 1, whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted he is blind having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. And this is the part I was saying I wanted to get to. You've noticed the emphasis this morning on being cleansed from our sins. And um, I've not seen this emphasis. Um, this passage has stood out to me for years, and I've not seen. I've always looked at this more, and, it, and it's correct that the person, they've, they've forgotten uh, that they have been cleansed from his former sins, and I've always taken that to look at as more. And so it's built a self-righteousness, which it has. Their, their, their walk with the Lord is flawed. But here it, it does mention specifically they have Forgot, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins, what's one of the most precious promises to us that we've been cleansed from our sins? Now let that kind of wash over you for a moment, that this person, they know Christ. They've had knowledge, but it's become so ineffective and unfruitful that they can't even, they're not even sure if they're clean from their sins. As I said, my plan is to continue this next week, but I wanted to give us some examples now of precious promises that were once real and alive, thriving and abounding in, our, in the, this person's heart, but now 
they have become blurred and forgotten for the person because that person's faith has stagnated. First John 1, 7, 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You ever wonder, I have wonder why First John does, just doesn't read if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You, have you ever wondered, I've wondered, oh, I don't wonder that anymore. Wow, God wants us to know. He said, this is the work I, I've forgiven you, Dave. I've, you know, I don't know how much to, to share, but I, the, the, I, every week, the, the forces of darkness, I do battle. And I'm not saying, no, oh, poor me. Just, just try to give you a little understanding of what goes on. And, and one, like I think it was a week before last, the battle was, because I've told you I've done things, and my, I've been in the place before God where things I can think of, it just makes me shudder. And it's like the enemy just took the bucket of the garbage of my past and just, just covered me with it. Now I had a choice then, I can believe the enemy or I can believe my God. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that's a precious promise. person that's not walking with the Lord, there's a believer that's not walking with, they've lost sight of that. Can't believe God for that anymore. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, I'll read all of these. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, and such. Oh, this is so great. And such were some of you. What happened? God cleaned you up through the blood of Jesus Christ, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Now that's standing. Now see, the person that really knows God can believe that. The person that's walking with God can believe that. I've put online some MacArthur messages, just so good. And one of the things he talks about, he says, you know, you, you, you don't trust your conscience. You don't believe your conscience. Your conscience will torment you. And he listed these other things you don't believe, you don't trust. You believe God, you believe his word. Such were some of you. Isaiah, here's things that God does with our sins that we need to believe him for. And you know, and we're just, this is almost like tip of the iceberg, it just, but concentrating on that has forgotten, what was, what was the verse? Um, forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins, so I wanted to focus on that. Isaiah 43, 25. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. See, he, it, 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 he, he does this for his own sake. Well, what, is, what does that mean? Because Christ paid that price. So now that's what God is bound to do when we believe in that promise that we're justified through believing in Christ. And I will not remember your sins. Psalm 103, we're more familiar with, 11, 103, 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Who are we going to believe? You have that bucket of slop from your past, 
you're tormented, and you know, we just, and, and it shakes and it shook me. Oh, I didn't want to hear. I thought of things I hadn't thought of in years. Most of it was true. But I believed God. It wobbled me. But you know what? There's great victory in believing God. You know, there's, there's one thing in just, just going through marching like a mighty infantry, and there's another thing where you're just kind of wobbly, but you're still going forward because you believe God. As far as east is from the west, so far as he remove our transgressions. Micah 7.19. Micah 7.19. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. This is our holy God. This is what God is doing and has done and will do for us. You will, speaking of God, cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Isaiah 38, 17, Behold, it was for my welfare that I had great bitterness, but in love you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. Romans 5, 20 and 21, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Do you believe that? If you know the Lord... In the way that Peter is telling us that we need to know him, you believe that. You, you, you know it's not right. You know you don't deserve it. But see, God tells us that too. That's God's truth too. No, we don't deserve it. But this is what happens. We're still pretty sinful wretches on this earth. You good people, <laughs> we are. I mean, it's just because the standard is a holy God. God, make sure we're believing God. He lets him point our sinfulness, that's true. And what he's done about it, we got to believe the precious promises. So this morning, here's the part I really wanted to get to. I wanted to invite you. This morning, I'd like to invite you to come on over and sit with me in the psalmist by the stormy sea and see the divine provision and power that God offers through Christ. His promise that he will give us everything we need for life and godliness no matter the storms of life. So, uh, you guys remember Beverly Hillbillies? You know, the funny thing is, is, with this video thing, I see what a goofball I am. <laughs> I see what a goofball I am at times. And here's another one. You know, old Jed Clampett hits you now. Come on over here and sit a spell. So, would you come on over here? sit a spell with me and the, the sons of Korah and rest in the precious promises of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ and believe him. Believe him about everything and believe everything he tells us about life and godliness. Believe him for everything he tells us about himself. So let me just finish very last thing this Psalm 46 first three verses again. As Jed Clampett would say, come on over and sit down for a little while. Here's a, plenty of room on this rock, this rock bench. I'm sitting on Psalm 46. God is a safe place to hide, ready to help when we need him. We stand fearless at the cliff edge of doom. It's the only people that truly know God can do that. Cliff edge of doom? Are you kidding me? Yeah, fearless because God's there ready to help, standing fearless at the cliff edge of doom, courageous in sea storm and earthquake before the rush and roar of oceans, the tremors that shift mountains, Jacob wrestling God fights for us, God of angel armies, God of angel armies protects us, those who know God. Let's pray. Thank you, mighty one. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God bringing your word to our hearts in Jesus name. Amen. I know a found where sins are washed away. I know a place where
more time without the piano. I know a fount where sins are washed away. I know a place where night is turned to day. Burdens are lifted, blind eyes made to see. There's a wonder-working power in the blood of Calvary. Grateful for each one here today, guide us as we, as we leave this place. 